Hello, everyone, and a huge welcome to all our guests tuning in. We're absolutely delighted to have you with us today. My name is Simon Groom, Director of Modern Contemporary Art at the National Galleries of Scotland in Edinburgh. A few notes of technical housekeeping before we begin. Everyone watching at home should have a Q&A button at the top right of your screen. Just press the button and share your questions with the panel. For everyone that submitted questions in advance, thank you. We'll get through as many as we can. We are here, of course, to discuss and view the unparalleled work of American artist, designer, visual effects cre creator, writer and producer, Ray Harryhausen. The Ray Harryhausen Titan of Cinema exhibition that we're thrilled to be sharing at the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art, in Modern 2 to be precise, from this coming Saturday, 24th of October until September next year, is the largest and most comprehensive exhibition of the art of the legendary trailblazer Harry Housen to date, who elevated stop motion to an art form between the 1950s and 1980s, and whose exhilarating movies inspired a generation of the world's greatest living filmmakers, among them Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Sir Peter Jackson, and Guillermo del Toro. Due to COVID, we were forced to delay the opening of the exhibition. We were originally meant to open in May, but this has since become October. And as we want everyone to stay safe whilst enjoying the exhibition, we've made a few changes. We've moved to an online only booking system. So visitors can now get their tickets by booking online up to three months in advance. And we've added some new measures such as physical distancing and mandatory face coverings whilst in the show itself. Hand sanitizers will also be provided in the building. To kick things off today, we wanted to show you a short preview film that gives you a taste of what's on show and a bit of, ba bit of background on the Harry Housen story as told by his daughter, Vanessa. He had a lot of strings to his bow, so to speak. He was first and foremost a film director and animator. And, you know, we've got all these beautiful pictures here, the artwork that he did. Just wanted to show all his talents. He had so many different aspects that he could do. I think this exhibition will show that. He was very kind and very patient. And I could go upstairs, you know, when I was home, I could go upstairs and see him work in his study. And off the study, he had a wee room where he used to do the sculptures and put things together, you know, the armatures and everything. Sometimes if he was in his office bed, I'd sit on the couch and he'd be sketching one of these wonderful black and white drawings and just chatting away, listening to music. And, you know, that's how I used to while my time away. He never turned you away unless, you know, he did his animation somewhere else. So at home, you know, you had sort of access to go up and see him. He just stuck it out, he just focused. Once he had a focus, he did it and he stuck to it, you know, however hard it was. I mean, you know how long it takes to animate, you know, he'd be locked away for three, four months animating stuff while actors and, and directors were making another film. It must have been quite lonely, I think, really, to just lock yourself away and do all this slow animation, but what an achievement afterwards and seeing the stills and everything, you know. I hear that he, with my grandparents in the garage in LA, he set up a wee thing with his parents so he could do the animation on the tables and that. And he just worked, plus going to night school, acting school. So he really just worked very, very hard. I think he stuck to the things that gave him pleasure so he could put his 110% into it. He was very passionate and he wanted people to have the fantasy and believe. He said it was very important for people to have that magic. It's such a hard world. When he grew up in the depression, it was hard. And so having this, this fantasy and believing that you're there for that hour or whatever, watching the film, you know, and getting right into it. That's very hard to project and get it through. And he did a beautiful, beautiful job of that. And so many people have said, well, the skeletons really frightened me. And I said, but they're only this high. Well, it's 40 years since Clash of the Titans. I think it's nearly over 80 years since all his films and everything have been going. And he's still going. And, and we've got all these wonderful fans coming out 
and different generations coming to look again. Now that's one big accolade really, isn't it? Somebody once asked, well, why is it in a modern art gallery? You know, and of course they think of very modern art. It's just showing all the different techniques over time. And I'm, I'm thrilled, Dad would have been thrilled in a gallery. I mean, a whole gallery. Normally it's just one room or two rooms. This is what, two, three floors? It's just wonderful and he would have been thrilled to pieces. I hope you all enjoyed that. We'll now move on to the Q&A section of our discussion. And I'm delighted to welcome to the virtual room, Ray's daughter and trustee of the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, Vanessa Harryhausen, as well as filmmaker and foundation trustee, John Walsh. Vanessa, John, welcome. How are you both? Very good, thank you. Yes, very good, Simon, and very excited about the exhibition. Great. Well, it's wonderful you're here, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, please do tell our audience a bit about yourself. The Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, your connection to the work of Ray Harryhausen, and a bit about the upcoming exhibition. Vanessa. Yes, I'm um, Ray Harryhausen's daughter, Vanessa Harryhausen, and I'm um, trustee for the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation. Yes, and I'm a trustee as well. I met Ray when I was an 18-year-old film student when I was at the London Film School, and I made a documentary about his life and work. I kept in touch with him over the years. He told me about the foundation that he set up in 1986 to preserve both the creature collection, but also his legacy of, of animation techniques. And, uh, and I was thrilled when he asked me to become uh, a trustee. He was always fascinated by my work in film and television, which was very different to his. Mine was mostly in documentaries and, and feature documentary. But um, myself and Vanessa and Simon McIntosh were the, uh, we're the magnificent three, aren't we? We're the three musketeers, Vanessa. Well, we try our best. <laughs> Thank you. For my side, I never had the great fortune to uh, meet Ray, but I was first approached by the foundation, I think probably in 2016, to see if the galleries were interested in making a show to celebrate what would have been the centenary of Ray Harryhausen's birth in 2020. Uh, this desire to hold a show only increased when I got to know more about the foundation, its incredible holdings, and also that it was based in Scotland. Uh, Vanessa, just wondering, what are your favourite memories of your father and his work? Um, well, as a child, I was very lucky to be able to just pop upstairs because he had his studio upstairs. Um, and uh, he used to do all his drawings and, and make his models upstairs. So I was be able to have access to go and see all this wonderful creativity coming forth. So many a time when I came back from boarding school, I'd sit on the couch and watch dad sketch away um, or make something in his, you know, in his little office off the office. Um, so it was a real privilege to see these wonderful creatures coming to life from a very basic drawing to a model and then, oh my gosh, you see it on the screen actually moving. And it was like, oh my God, but it's only this big, you know? It's, <laughs> so it was, it was a great privilege. And I, and I, I got, um, I guess I, I got more appreciative as I got older and I understood more. It was just taken for granted really early on because it was always there. And John, for you? Um, well, I was a typical fanboy. You know, I'd read about Ray Harryhausen's films in magazines like Starburst and Starlog. And of course, this is before the days of the internet. So when I got the opportunity to visit him at his house and see the entire, most of the collection in his house in West London, I was um, I was dumbstruck, almost. Um, because, you know, to see up close Pegasus or the Kraken or Medusa um, and all the other wonderful creatures, and then to be allowed access to that collection for my short documentary, which... Um, which I had narrated by Tom Baker back in back in the late eighties, and it's now been donated wow. to the foundation's uh, film and tape archive. So you know, I remember being wowed by the, the the magnificence of the creatures, but also humbled by Ray's generosity. He didn't need to help me at all, and he did. Yeah, he sounds very special. Um, why do you think we still celebrate and remember Ray and his work? I mean, what is it about his work, his films, that does make it so special? 
Um, well, I think it's because he was a one-man band. He literally started off doing everything from the technical drawings to making the models. And, and you know, he had to have all that to show these producers to bring this dream come true for a film to and the, the audiences to, to, to get involved. So I think because he was a one-man band and he did so many different things on it, I think it was... Um, I think that's what that really helped, um, you know, keep his his talent alive and, and whatnot. I think Vanessa's yeah, right. And, you know, been... Ray, yeah, he, he didn't uh, facilitate somebody else's vision. You know, when we think about previous special effects innovators like Willis O'Brien, who was wonderful and brought King Kong to life. And we think about more recent innovators like Dennis Muren and Phil Tippett from Industrial Light and Magic, who have many Oscars between them. All of these people were brought in to facilitate another filmmaker's vision. Ray Harryhausen facilitated his own vision, his own filmmaking aesthetic, as it were. So there's been nobody else so far in film history that's also been the instigator of their own special effects. You know, he was the producer on these films. We sometimes forget that. He was the writer. He was the story conceiver. So, you know, he, he does occupy a solitary place in, uh, in, in film history. But what's extraordinary about that is that that vision and seeing it all through from conception to realisation was done by one person, yet it has such universal appeal. Why do you think his films have remained so popular? Um, I think it's because of, uh, I want to say the fantasy in it, but it's a believable, a believable thought of, of a dinosaur moving or they just, they don't look like they're rubber. I, I don't think anyway. Um, and the movement and the, the personality, each creature has a personality and a sort of its own little identity. And he puts so much thought and um, believability into these creatures that you, you actually, you know, I've heard loads of fans saying, you know, they really did live that, that film. So I think that's what's carried it on, the, the fantasy and the, you know, the, the magic of it all. Yeah. So, of course, Ray's work isn't, isn't photo real. It's not CGI. And so some people might say, well, that's a preference. I prefer it to be photo real. However, when we look back at the films from the last 10, 15 years and the computer graphics then, it looks quite rudimentary. And, you know, the one thing computer graphics has had in common since it was first conceived for cinema right up until now you need entire banks of people, animators, crafting away, working at the fur, perhaps on a creature, and then the lighting and, and something else. So Ray Harryhausen performed through his fingertips into these creatures. So it's a single performance from a single actor. So if you tried to do a computer-generated Marlon Brando today and farmed it out to thousands of people, it might be photoreal, but it won't have that little spark of performance. So Ray was an actor. He acted through his his very large fingers, his banana-like fingers, as Vanessa used to call them, into these creatures. And the fact that he's, um, his work has, has had such longevity and has been rescanned in 4K, I think it's a testament to, to his power as a performer. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Vanessa, um, how did this exhibition come about and, and why the National Galleries of Scotland? What's, what's the link there for you? Um, well, I believe we we um, approached you, and the link is that my mother uh, is the great great granddaughter of David Livingstone, the explorer. So that's the Scottish connection to the American side, um, and uh, it. Um, I guess it just yeah, you just ran with it, really. The idea, yeah. You, you said something well, in your. But, yeah. Sorry, John. You said something in your opening film just about how thrilled Ray would have been to have seen it in a gallery, not just one room, but the whole extent of it. And certainly, you know, from where I'm sitting, you know, as a um, director of the gallery, is that um, it's really important and interesting to think about Ray within that art historical context, because of course, you know. He was an art collector, he responded to art. Well, not a collector, but he had a good eye for art. 
and in the Scottish National Gallery at the moment we're showing a work that did belong to him that's Joseph Gandhi by Joseph Gandhi uh, a Victorian painter a very early Victorian painter and it's a painter called Jupiter's Pluvius uh, which is an amazing vision of um, some uh, kind of classical scene that you know you could see as a direct inspiration for one of Ray's movies. Also is very influenced by Gustave Doré and uh, the French artist from the uh, 19th century and again there's a very direct take by Ray on one of his drawings for the Mysterious Island. So there's that that I'm fascinated by so it's, it's the idea of art history informing a very popular medium then there's also the biographical that Ray went to art college, uh, studied there at um, the University of Southern California. He studied uh, painting, life drawing, um, and photography. And then there's a technique, isn't there? I mean, he said that, I mean, he's an amazing draftsman. You see some of the storyboards in the exhibition. And one of the things, one of the quotes that is in my mind is uh, how he said that drawing for him was so important because it was the only way of releasing the bizarre subjects in his head and it allowed others to see into his imagination, which I think is an amazing quote. So to have that kind of draftsmanship on the one hand, but then also he was so technically innovative. You just look at the models and the way that he used his hands, he put things together. So whether it was making models or whether it was actually coming up with new techniques in the form of dynamation, all that for me is, a, is you know, the, the, the true uh, characteristics of an artist. But more than all of those, I think, is essentially that he had this amazing vision. And for me, all great artists changed the way that we see the world. And Harry Housen certainly did that in spades. John, I don't know whether you had any other thoughts. Yes, no, I agree with all of that, uh, Simon. And of course, he, um, he was predicting trends in cinema as well. You know, when we think of Ray with his producer's hat on, he, he, um, he rightly thought that Arabian Adventures would be coming back he helped Hammer Films, who are mostly known for horror films like Frankenstein and Dracula, have their financially most successful film with a non-horror film, with One Million Years BC, with a scantily clad Raquel Welsh being chased by dinosaurs. So people forget that that was their financially most successful film. So Ray was always thinking of new ideas. Hollywood didn't always receive them well. I mean, for every film that Ray made, there was five or six that he planned and didn't make. So we have 16 feature films in the sort of the Ray Harryhausen legacy, but there are many films that call the lost movies that went unmade. And yet he was always drawing, he was always doodling. And uh, any one of his doodles would of course look wonderful on the walls of the uh, National Galleries of Scotland. <laughs> I think that's the point, isn't it? I mean, there's only limited space um, and the foundation is such a treasure trove of, of richness and does show I suppose just, just how his imagination and uh, his eye kind of crept into so many different areas, had so many different stories. So um, given the breadth of such great work, what made the final cut for the exhibition? And was it hard to make the decisions on what was to be included and what was not to be included? <laughs> Vanessa? Um, gosh, yes. Well, as you say, the, we've got so many items and so wonderful many things, but really, I think in this exhibition, it shows um, his very early days um, and his sketching and the artist side. People m know more of his film side and his animation, but this is great because you're seeing another side to dad, you know, all his technical drawings, all his thoughts, even the very basic sketches with a bit of armature in it. And that was, you know, I think that's great for the public because it sort of gives them a little insight on his thought process. So how am I going to get this dinosaur to move? How many joints do I need in this thing? You know, so it's wonderful that you've got such a wonderful collection of of the very beginnings, you know, of how he, he got into films and, and his sketches and everything to um, up to, you know, his last movie in that. Absolutely. So, you know, when we think about the evolution of his work, what we might call his workflow, um, you can see that Ray didn't start out the gate as a sophisticated animator. He started, you know, working as an amateur filmmaker at home. His parents helped Put together some of the models so you know for young people coming to the exhibition they need to know that there is an entry point you know you can see yourself as a young ray harryhausen and get started 
And, you know, the great thing about the scope of this uh, exhibition, it's the largest of its kind ever, ever mounted, is that you get a real sense of the evolution, you know, where Ray started, what he developed and what he achieved as he went forward. And uh, although we haven't been able to include everything, the Foundation's archive is 50,000 items strong. Uh, some of them are in, in a book that I wrote last year, which is Harry House and the Lost Movies, which is a little plug for my book. But um, more importantly, a plug <laughs> I'm hoping for Vanessa's brand new book, which accompanies uh, the exhibition as well. Isn't that right, Vanessa? Yes. Oh, gosh, am I going to have to show up mine now? OK, I don't know if you guys can see that. Yeah. Ray Harryhausen, wow. Titan of Cinema. Fabulous. And there's been so many wonderful books by your father himself. And of course, Richard Hollis's movie poster book, The Lost Movies book. Um, but yours is almost the definitive uh, tome. What, 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 can you, what can you tell us about it? Well, mine's more of the family side. It's not so much on the technical, though there is technical bits in it. Um, but it's just my observations and memories, wonderful family memories of, of us together and um, some stories that people do know and some iconic creatures that are in it and some not. Um, so I think hopefully it's a, it's a book for everybody. It's a light, it's a light hearted book, but it, it sort of gives you an idea of, of what he was like at home. And he was a great dad. He really was. So it's sort of Harryhausen in 100 items, isn't it? In a sense, they've been selected by yourself. Yeah, but actually we wrote way, way more, but we couldn't fit it all in. So it was really to celebrate <laughs> his 100th birthday. Um, you know, he would have been 100 if he, in June this, this, this year if he had survived. So um, it was just to celebrate his life and, um, you know, a, a hopefully a wonderful tribute to a wonderful man. And you've had uh, many famous uh, friends and fans contribute to your new book. I have. God bless them. They've been very generous in, in putting things in. So that's, that's great. Thank you. I mean, there's um, certainly the, the book um, is accompanying the exhibition. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent read, new insights um, into the show and into the man. As you say, there's a, there's a kind of universality about um, the films, about the reach uh, that is truly international. I mean, we've seen that from the reaction to the exhibition. Uh, it crosses all generations. Um, you know, I've got a small child who uh, has been living with this for four years now and is just beside himself uh, waiting to see the exhibition. Um, equally, you know, I talk to um, grandparents of, and things and, you know, they're all excited about it. So I think for, for once it's, it's an exhibition that really does cross all divides, all populations. You've talked a bit about um, trying to put uh, such a big life into the finite spaces of galleries. Um, I'm going to ask you what should probably be the killer question. What's your favourite piece in the exhibition? Vanessa first. Um, I don't know. I'm glad that people are seeing all his artwork and his thought process because they know him through his animation and his films. And hopefully, I mean, I know we've had a lot of books out with about Dad and there's been artwork in it. But this is a little bit more in depth and behind where he started at the very, very beginning. So, um, yeah, I, I, I hope this just gives him a bit more of an insight to a different side of, of him, not just being a director and film producer, but an artist, as you said, on so many different scopes. John, a favourite piece, Vanessa, can you, can you, are you going to answer the, the uh... Oh, <laughs> me, the tough question. I favorite. I'm, it's very difficult. It is. It's, very difficult. It's. I'm not going to go there. I love all of it. I really do. I really love all of it, and it's a great tribute to him. Well, look, we had a a poll um, that polled everyone around the planet. Thousands and thousands. It was over a hundred thousand people replied to find out their top ten Harry and creatures. And of course, you know. If uh, if you come to the exhibition, you can find out. If you look online, you can see that top 10. And of course, the greatest hits are in there. You know, it's a skeleton's Medusa and so on, and Bubo the Owl. Ray asked me that question when I was 18, when I went to see him at his house, because a part of, um, of him was, I didn't realise this until I was older. It was an interview process. He wanted to check if I really knew his films and really knew his work. And he'd say to me, well, what was your favourite? Um, because most people would say the skeletons from Jason the Argonauts. So I said to him, ah, well, my other favourite sequence was this. 
And he was fascinated to hear my answer, my reasons behind it. And it's a very small sequence where the homunculus, which is a small winged creature, is brought back to life by Prince Kura, played by Tom Baker in The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. And he's on a tabletop, uh, the homunculus, and he's, he's dead. And Kura cuts his hand and lets some of the blood drip from his hand onto the homunculus. And slowly, carefully, he comes to life in front of his master. And of course, it's a metaphor, a very obvious metaphor, for how Ray Harryhausen breathed life into these creatures. And yes, it's a very small and subtle sequence. It'll make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And when we've played that sequence or those films for young people, um, there's a hushed tone within the cinema. And it's very eerie. That's my favourite. He put his personality into it. He really did. And his creatures, you can see it. He really can. Yes. Yeah. And it's not just the creatures. I mean, even though, you know, we're showing pretty much all of the most iconic uh, characters from, uh, you know, 20th century uh, stop motion animation. I mean, it's the other things as well that for me really does it. So whilst it's amazing to see the original skeletons, the thing that really did it for me, which which I don't know, I, I'm still trying to work out the power, is um, the model he has of the Oakland Ferry Terminal Building. And I think it's because it's in, um, it came from beneath the sea. And I think it's because um, I was in San Francisco a couple of years ago and went to the building and, you know, didn't think anything of it. That when I saw it in the exhibition, it triggered a memory for me of being back there, but then of having seen the film and it was a really powerful moment that completely took me off guard. So even the props have that power, I realize, to bring out memories of things that, you know, I saw when I was a child. I mean, you know, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, it, it, it's that kind of, um, I think, power that um, some of the objects in that in this exhibition really has. And um, I, it, it just surprises me. I mean, we've got, I think, several hundred objects in the exhibition from the foundation so um there's a there's a lot to see and i think everybody will probably have their own favorite in the end um now um we've got some questions we'll open up uh, to questions from the audience um and i'm delighted to say that we've got one from hugh mcstay from london horror society who'd like to ask vanessa what do you think your father would think of his amazing works still being shown and loved the world over? I think he would be, he was a very humble man and he was very touched when everybody, you know, people used to come to him and say, oh, I saw this or, you know, I remember this. And um, so he'd be thrilled. He would be thrilled that, you know, all you guys are keeping this alive after 80 plus years. Um, and it's, it's a real tribute that he's obviously touched. A load, load of people in different different ways, from art to film to, you know, sculptures. I hope okay. that answers the question. Another one, another one from Hugh. Um, just how influential do you think the work the work of Ray Harryhausen has been to generations of filmmakers? John, you touched on that earlier. Do you want to expand a bit more? Well, of course. So young filmmakers, much like myself, but people who are, ended up being more famous than me, um, actually would contact and correspond with Ray when they were amateur filmmakers. And Ray would write back and advise and so on. And he did this on several occasions with people like Phil Tippett, uh, Dennis Muren and so on. And, and even a young Rick Baker who'd sent a mask of the Cyclops room. Rick Baker now is an Academy Award winner times seven or eight times. So, you know, he always had time and patience for people. So, you know, there's, there's that legacy element. But there's also the commercial legacy element Many of Ray's films have been scanned in 4K, which is very unusual for films of this budget and from this era. The 4K process at the moment is quite expensive. So studios do that not to keep us at the foundation happy, but because they know there's a commercial imperative for getting films out there and having them sold again to audiences. So people who had the memories of seeing them in cinemas at the time and now want to show them to their families can show them in a, in a brighter, crisper way than ever. And I used to sit with Ray when I recorded commentaries with him with the Blu-ray versions of his films. And he was always fascinated by how new technology can, can reveal an extra layer of, uh, of the filmmaking process. Um, got another one from um, Stuart uh, Bannerman for Vanessa. 
What do you think will be the most popular creation that people will flock to? Oh, I think there'll be several. Um, definitely the skeletons. Um, Medusa, maybe. Uh, Bubo. Some people like Bubo from Clash of the Titans. Um, it really depends on the in individual. It might be the iconic ones, or it might be just some of the, the not so. The list is endless, really, isn't it? Yeah. It is, yeah. And the follow-up question, follow question from Stuart was, uh, what's your favourite or your father's, of your father's works? Well, I grew up, as everybody knows the story of Guanji. So the, the, the dinosaur in Guanji is my favourite, probably. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and John, Vanessa, have there been any surprises or new discoveries that you've made um, from seeing the exhibition or things that, you, that have been drawn out from this exhibition that maybe you think about him slightly differently? Um, no, it's just brought home more that he, what an extraordinary artist he is and how talented and what wide scope he had. Um, and and it's, 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 I'm very proud of it. Well, no, no scrap of paper would go unused. So whether yeah. it's the Lost Movies book or Vanessa's brilliant new book, you know, that new book, Titan of Cinema, was created to accompany the exhibition. So Vanessa, Vanessa did a deep dive into the archive and we did find new things, Vanessa. So as a result of this exhibition and the, the new book you've written, you know, new things have been uncovered, new sketches. Um, it's, it's very exciting. There's lots of new photography in the book. So just when we think we've we've got it all out there and published it, and there you go, um, you've gone and done it again. <laughs> and there's more still to be found. <laughs> yes. I mean, just to say in the exhibition, there are works that are being shown for the very first time, some of those early marionettes that were found in the garage in LA. Um, and also, um, we've been working with a restorer on uh, some of the models. So there's a lot, lot of material here that hasn't been seen before, is being seen in a, in a new state. Another question is, Vanessa, can you talk about the things that influenced your father's work? Um, well, everybody knows that obviously he, st he started off loving King Kong, the film King Kong. So that was his absolute tipping point of where he, he got curious in that. And he wanted to know how the film was made and things branched from that, um, you know, his, his career and, and, and wanting to go to night school and how did this happen? So I think that, that was the, the, the basis of his whole um, career really at the, at the beginning. But that showed enormous patience, didn't it? I mean, if, if there was anything you wanted to do today, even if it was how to make your own iPhone, Go on the internet, you'll find a few instructional videos, you get a sense of it after an hour's research. How was Ray going to find out how stop motion was created? The studios would not talk about those techniques, mainly because they didn't want to cheat the audience into thinking they'd been fooled, but also because there's a um, there's a, a work professional ethic there as well. You don't want other studios learning those, uh, those cinematography tricks. So it must have been very difficult because there was no books on it at the time. So he was really a detective trying to find out um, how the technique came about. It took years. It wasn't something that happened overnight. And it kept on evolving, didn't it? I mean, he kept on refining yes. and uh, it getting more and more complicated. And I think you see that passage as you go through the exhibition. You see some of the very early models that he used. And then the process of dynamation, which uh, we, we, um, we, we replicate during the exhibition so that you know, it becomes an experience that you can see before your eyes. So we've tried to take it apart. But the weird thing is, in taking it apart, it becomes even more incredible. I mean, it doesn't diminish it. It enhances the experience. And I think that's, that's the same. When you see these models in the flesh, you know, it's amazing to see the original thing. But actually, it's amazing then to realize that these have haunted your imagination all your life. I mean, it, it's, it's truly astonishing. Um, Vanessa, another question here. Were there any artists that he was inspired by? We touched a bit on um, Gustave Doré uh, and uh, O'Brien, but were there any other artists, many different mediums that um, he liked? 
I think Charles Knight was a, a known for doing the dinosaurs and stuff. He was a famous American artist, and I think that influenced Daddy very much. Um, and, and like you say, you know, John Martin and the classic, you know, Gustav Doré's with the backdrops, and you can see in Dad's pictures a lot of influence with the black and white and, and the, the beautiful depth, um, you know, in his pictures. So I think those artists probably had a great... Um, a great uh, influence on him, including um, Frederick Remington. We've got a lovely little um, sculpture of a cowboy falling off a, well, he's rolling off a horse and the horse is upside down. He did this with, I think he was between 15 and 17 years old. It's in a resin compound. I mean, I couldn't do that. I don't know how many people, and the, you've got the muscle detail, you've got everything. So, you know, these artists, these these people like John Martin and Gustave Doré really influenced him to study anatomy and that through the classics. And of course, he described Gustave Doré as the original art director for films, uh, and not just because of his, um, his, his sketching ability, but also the composition, you know, the framing, um, became very important. So when we look at the concept art that Ray created in Charcoals, you can see there's a great attention paid to composition, you know, where subsidiary players are, how the focus isn't always in the centre of the frame. So uh, very effective, very effective research. So this brings us on to the next question, um, which is, and I suppose it uh, depends how you define animator in this uh, question, how many animators were used for the big scenes, the iconic skeleton scene, for example? Um, I think it was only Dad, wasn't it, John? Yep. Uh, the only the only film in which um, Ray had some additional help was for Clash of the Titans because the animation schedule was just phenomenal. More animation in that than there was in four or five of his films combined. But right up until then, only Ray. Nobody else would help him on those sets, you know, those miniature sets. It would only be Ray. He couldn't afford the distraction because he's counting. He's counting in his mind the, the whole time, one twenty-fourth of a second for the movement. So I, I said to him, you never took up smoking and so on. He said, no, because he, he didn't have a spare set of hands, you know. So <laughs> lucky for him and for us that he didn't. He lived to a grand age into his 90s because the film industry is notorious for, for particularly people in the camera department smoking. I remember this when I first entered film, that um, everyone was offering me cigarettes all the time. Um, so, no, it was only Ray um, right up until the last film. Uh a really tricky question now. Um, however, you've both been asked, what's your favourite Harryhausen film? Um, well, I suppose because I was on set, it would be Golden Voyage and, and, and then Eye of the Tiger because um, I was on, on set for those two. But then I was on set for Clash of the Titans as well. But probably Golden Voyage on, on mine because I loved Kali with all the arms. You know, I thought that sequence and the fight sequence was extraordinary. It's the golden voyage of Sinbad for me as well. Um, I, I ended up working with Tom Baker, who who won the role of Doctor Who after appearing in the golden voyage of Sinbad. The producers went to see the picture, needed a replacement for John Pertwee, and he got the job. So um, it's, it has everything. You know, it has great story, has the wonderful Caroline Monroe. Um, you know, all of Ray's energies from the original Arabian adventure he'd done in the uh, late 1950s, he was able to refine it. So really, it, it, in some ways, it's the ultimate Harryhausen vehicle. It has everything and a story by Ray Harryhausen as well. It's perfect. What would you say to younger film fans who are perhaps unaware of Ray Harryhausen's work? Um... Look them up, <laughs> look, um, do some research and see, you know, look at this, come here, come and see the wonderful exhibition. You know, it's, it shows his very early pup puppets here where he started. Some of them are a bit, a bit um, let's say, um, how would I say it? Handmade. Not so good. Yes, handmade and very basic. But, you know, it's important for the youngsters to understand that you can't just suddenly produce. Dad didn't just suddenly become a, a wonderful artist. He had to work at it. So that's why we. I wanted to, you to put this early stuff in so the kids could understand the very beginnings and give them encouragement. It doesn't matter how bad your stuff is. Carry on and just keep on going. And then 
hopefully you'll you'll become as as, as wonderful artist like that. Absolutely. Look, um, Ray Harryhausen, and had he been here, would be a hundred years old. And so for young people, that's an incredible age to consider. And of course, the wonderful <laughs> National Galleries of Scotland is is a, an august institution that has many older artifacts than that. So, you know, for a child, they may feel sort of very much removed from that because they're, they're very young. There are more hours and minutes of stop motion animation happening today than at any time when Ray was working, both in commercials, both on the internet, um, in cinema. We think of the films of Tim Burton, Frank and Weenie, um, the, the studio Leica, Ardman Animations. There is work to be had. If you're a, a competent stop motion animator, you will work. And in this sort of lockdown environment, if you can work at home in a home studio, you will be employed. So if your parents look at you and say, no, don't be a stop motion animator, that's something of the past. You can tell them they're wrong. You can be well paid as a stop motion animator. And uh, one day you might become the next Ray Harryhausen. Who knows? <laughs> as incentive. Um, question from uh, Jason Gilchrist. Uh, of all the Harryhausen movies and scenes not made, which would Ray most have wanted to see realized? John, I'm going to let question. you answer that one. Oh, you'll, you'll find them here, which is at the exhibition in my brand new book, um, Harry House and the Lost Movies. Um, look, Ray was involved with so many projects. Um, there was a sequel to Clash of the Titans that he had his heart set on in the mid 80s. That's in there. I think the project that he put the most energies into where he created artwork, test footage and models was his 1948 version of War of the Worlds. Now, that version would have had the alien invaders on tripoded legged machines, as H.G. Wells had intended. About a decade or so later, George Powell did his wonderful version, but the, uh, they were on saucers and flying on strings. So I think Ray was disappointed by that. He would very much like to have created War of the Worlds. And I think it's a real shame that we didn't, didn't get to see it because the artwork is fabulous. So War of the Worlds, I suspect. But he always, always fancied remaking King Kong. So right up until the sort of the mid 70s, when he was beaten to it by Dino De Laurentiis, um, Ray was very keen to, uh, to remake King Kong. The story of that, along with many others, Ray also turned down. This is quite surprising. People oh, raise their eyebrows so we can hear the collective gasp. And I say he turned down the first Marvel feature film. Ooh. Thunk it. And just to follow up on Jason's question, can we see an element of it? At the end of uh, sketches and things for films that were never made. Sorry, Simon, you cut out. So the yes, of that. there are elements. I did. Yes. Okay. Jason, just as a follow up to your question, can we see elements of it at the exhibition? Uh, yes, there are um, drawings and sketches and things uh, from movies that were never made, uh, and uh, there's a lot of that in the exhibition too. Uh, question from Jack Dillon. What was Ray's favourite creation? Was there anything that he loved in particular? Um, well, I always heard him say that he tried not to have favourites because they'd get jealous of each other. So that's I'm sticking to my dad's line. <laughs> Uh, but I think the more well, complicated the, the more complicated the creature to animate, I think did he like that challenge. Although I can probably controversially say, I hope I don't get into trouble, the creature which gave him the uh, um, the most headaches or the most anxiety. And that was the the very complicated so. but the incredibly graceful and, and, and beautiful Pegasus because he was... Yeah. Um, he was very complicated to animate. If you'd made any mistake with the rhythmic motions of the gallop and the wings, then the whole sequence had to be abandoned. Whereas there were there was little tricks in other animated sequences where you could you could cut around. And he said that uh, he'd go into the studios in the mornings and see Pegasus there ready. And uh, he would take sort of a deep breath and sort of get on with it because that was that was tough. That was tough. And 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 it's it stands up. You know, when you see clips of Pegasus now, he's magnificent. Um, question from Simon Hooper. Um, you've discovered new drawings and models for the exhibition. What's the most unusual place that they've been found and how? So they've talked about the garage. Yeah, um, 
just on you just have to look at every sketchbook on the back um he did doodles on the back of books and and in in various sketchbooks as i said but yeah you just had to make sure every little piece of paper was was turned over and um you know looked at yes because even okay. on the back of lesser heads he was used lesser heads and so on yeah there's a yeah there's a good um section within the exhibition of um personal elements uh, that haven't been seen before so you know from the oscar to uh letters photographs um of um him um well i mean going back through his life so there's a huge amount here that uh, hasn't been seen um, question about will the books be available at the exhibition in the gift shop? Yes, they will. There's be a wide range of uh, all kinds of books, um, uh, plus Vanessa's new book, uh, as well as all kinds of things you can imagine uh, that will go around um, that would be associated with this exhibition. Question for Vanessa. Were you tempted to follow in Ray's footsteps and become an animator? I contemplated it very briefly. But then I saw all the hard, hard work and the lonely, lonely hours that daddy did. And I thought, no, I think I might stick to illustration and doing something similar, simpler. Yeah, okay. Um, the exhibition looks amazing. Thank you. What was the process of preserving and exhibiting these historic pieces safely? Uh, so, well, we have our one. Oh, sorry. No, come on, carry on, Vanessa. I was going to say about our conservator, Alan Friswell, who my dad hired to um, restore and, and, and look after these, these wonderful creatures that were deteriorating because there were so many different, I guess, different types of rubber that dad did over the years. And it just, some of it stood up really well, some of it's really soft and pliable. Other is 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 just deteriorating. So, you know, Alan is there to. He's got his own little compound. I can't go into that. The the technical stuff that what he uses to to restore the stuff. But um, under Dad's um, you know supervision, he he restores and and um, stabilizes all these wonderful creatures and brings them back to the original color and you know um, look. Yes, that's right, because uh, in the past, some of the uh, liquid latexes and rubbers that Ray was using are no, no longer available for a health and safety point of view. So Alan has to try and mimic, if you like, the same sort of polymer base um, so that he, he gets the same sort of textures, but also to try and stabilise the creatures so they don't need constant uh, repainting and, and re-examining. But we do take extensive photography before and after. So people are sometimes conscious about colouring the past by doing this but it very much is a restoration and it's what Ray Harryhausen intended to do. And if he was with us today, he would approve what we're doing. We now have to think of how to conserve and preserve Alan Friswell, our restorer. We haven't <laughs> figured that one out yet. Last question. Did Ray ever receive any pushback from studios who may have been a little apprehensive? Um, I'm sure he did. Um, I'm sure John would like to answer this question, if that's all right. Yep. Pushback from everyone on every project at every moment. In the Lost Movies book, there are nearly 80, 80, 80 projects that Ray was involved with that didn't happen. So it's an incredible... It's an incredible determination he had to keep going when people would say no, no, no. Because if you're a head of a studio and you've commissioned a Ray Harryhausen film today you're going to be talking about maybe three and a half years perhaps before it's actually on screen and you might not be head of the studio anymore. So people are very concerned with their position when they're commissioning something. So you have to have real faith in yourself that you'll still be in post when the film is delivered, but also that that um, audiences' tastes haven't changed in the three years it's taken for the film to come out. So an awful lot of pushback. You know, for studios who didn't really understand the technique or didn't value what Ray was doing, there was pushback. But almost every Hollywood filmmaker will tell you they got pushback from everyone. You know, Steven Spielberg was pushed back by everyone on E.T. and so on and so on. So it's like that famous story of turning down the Beatles. And I'm sure many people now were very sorry that they turned down Ray Harryhausen as many times as they did. 
Thank you, John. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, and thank you, everybody, for um, asking such interesting questions. I'm afraid that's all we have time for now. So all that remains to say is thank you so much again for your continued support. We'll play you out with a final video that previews the exhibition in all its glory. A few words from me on why I think everybody should come and visit this amazing exhibition. Thank you. We got approached by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation about four or five years ago now, who were looking to celebrate the centenary of what would have been Harryhausen's birth in 2020. And it was an idea that at the beginning I thought, well, probably wasn't for us because it seemed to be much more about movie making and the cinema. But the more I looked at it, the more I thought about it, the more I realized actually here was a story of a true artist of the 20th century just working in a very different form. And then the more that I began to talk about it with others, the more I realised actually how influential he had been upon a whole generation of kids growing up. So not only was he a phenomenal draftsman, but also amazing technically with his hands that he could make pretty much these models and make them live and come alive. But he had enormous empathetic vision. When he made a model, it seemed that he really did endow it with some kind of spirit. So when you see these creatures on the screen, you feel some kind of sense of uh, that they're real, that they're living, that they're not just mere matter that's been animated, that they have a kind of spirit. And I think that's an amazing achievement. Harry House and I think also look to art history. Downstairs in the first room, you can see a drawing that he did that's based on a Gustave Doré, the 19th century French artist. And it's a sense of mystery, there's a sense of other worlds there that Harry Housen's films take you to in the same way that Gustave Doré's drawings do. And at the Scottish National Gallery, we're going to be showing a work, a very large painting by Joseph Gandhi called Jupiter's Pluvius. And that's this amazing Victorian narrative painting of a kind of scene of biblical proportions. And it's exactly the kind of landscape, it's exactly the kind of um, construction that Harry Housen made in his movies. So there's an art historical tradition and then what it is that he himself inspires. And I think what he does is he provokes that sense of imagination. He changes the way that people see the world. And I think any good artist can do that. And the fact that he did it in the most democratic of medium, in cinema, doesn't disqualify him. In fact, it makes him all the more important at these times when you're really trying to reach out to people and you celebrate creativity in all its forms. And Harry Housen, for me, is one of the true great artists of the 20th century. When people come to the exhibition, they will see the sense of skill. They will see things frozen in time that they've seen move on screen. And I think it's that sense of the inanimate coming alive that sense of something that you don't quite expect to live, to have breath, to have a character that comes alive before you, is that power of imagination, I think, that people will really get out of this. So in this exhibition, we've really tried to give visitors a sense of who Harry Housen was, what his influence was, how he developed his technique, and to introduce visitors to all of his main characters, all of whom are here life size. So we've tried to have interactive elements, immersive elements within the exhibition just to try and recreate some of the feeling of watching a film. When you watch his films you do get completely caught up in them, you get transported to different worlds. We've tried to take the same approach with the exhibition and downstairs in the last room you get to find out about who he's influenced subsequently, techniques to make your own stop-motion animation using a record player but also to have a go with a green screen and you can place yourself within the frame, within the image of fighting with some of his characters. I mean, it's a great family experience. So this is certainly the largest exhibition there has been of Harry Housen. The foundation has worked with a restorer who has brought back to life many of the characters that were in the films that for one reason or another had begun to deteriorate because latex is kind of form of rubber has uh, deteriorates with time. But they've worked with an amazing restorer so that what you're seeing here in many instances are models that look like they would have done when the films were first made. 
and Harryhausen cannibalized a lot of his models, but here we have all the structures, the armatures. We're surrounded by these iconic characters from cinema. And it's amazing, that sense of scale. When you sit at the cinema and you see the human beings dwarfed by these amazing creations, and here they all are in the gallery.